Hello and welcome to another edition of Beyond the Hype. I'm Alfred Edmund Jr., Senior Vice President and Executive Editor at Large at Black Enterprise. And this episode of Beyond the Hype is brought to you by City. Listen, guys, you, you know I'm excited every time I do this show because I always have interesting people. But, you know, about every third to fourth show, it's somebody that I actually know and like. And this brother, um, it's been too long since we've seen each other, of course, with, through, coming after this economic shutdown from the pandemic. There's a whole bunch of people we could say that about. But uh, when he said he could be available to be on the show, um, I was real happy. I'm just looking forward to, to just this conversation. Please welcome to the show this one of the stars of the number one series on Amazon, The Boys, Marvin T., Mother's Milk, Laz Alonso. Man, it's so good to see you, bro. How you doing, man? It's good to see you too, man. Thank you for having me. First of all, Black Enterprise has always been a platform that uh, even back when I was at Howard University and School of Business, it was my dream to be recognized in Black Enterprise. And at that time, we didn't have platforms like this where we could do Zoom calls and calls on camera using Riverside and all these other technology. It was just the, the physical hard magazine that we had at the time but that was you know that that was among one of the many publications that inspired me to shoot for the stars so it's an honor being here and it's an honor being here with a friend uh, i consider you a friend and you've always been extremely welcoming and just a good brother just hitting me up checking up on me and i appreciate you for that man yeah, you're on my list for the lack of a better word. I was trying to think of what I what I would call it when I was getting ready for this conversation. It, it's kind of a brother's prayer check-in list. You, you, you're not the only one, you know, and you know, every once in a while, I'll just say, it's time for you to just check in with brothers. That's right. And, you know, in our in our work, our respective careers, we're busy, we're serving a lot of people, we, we, we're committed to doing a lot of things with a lot of people. And I started doing it, and, I, you know, my some of my audience already knows about this, like, how about sometimes people reach out to you and they're not asking you for anything? Yeah. They're not, you know, they're not, they're just saying, don't want anything. You don't even have to respond. Right. Just let you know, I'm thinking about you and I'm checking on you. I just you want know. to make sure you're good. And, and exactly, exactly. Right. And, and especially after these, we were doing it way before the pandemic, but especially after the last couple of years, it's just a, it's a good thing to do. Um, but just to let my audience know, so they'll know, you know, that this isn't just because I'm a fan of the boys. I've, I've been a fan of Laz, you know, um, going back to, okay, I'm going to go through some of the things that I just followed you because I just love the work. Breakout Kings. I was one of, I was, you know, they called it a cult following. I don't know what it was. I thought that was a great show. Loved you on it. Loved the, the whole concept for the show on A&E. Um, the Mysteries of Laura. I'll be straight up. I watched it because you were on the show. It, it was a good show. But I was like, no, Laws is on it. And you, you just made it a great, a good show, a great show. Uh, obviously, you've done blockbusters like Avatar. Um, you're part of the Fast and Furious franchise. Um, and then, of course, I got to know you, I think, more personally after Jumping the Broom because I covered that more in depth. I watched the screening in Dallas at uh, Bishop Jake's um, you know, house and the house, but, you know, the theater and did the big screening. Um, and just over the years, you know, gotten to know you. And I always, let me just say this, and I said this about your work to other people, so this is not something I just say to you. Your work has been so diverse and, you know, you've done the, the kind of the blockbuster film, you know, um, you know, series, you've done the, you know, the cable show, you have mystery, you got, you, you know, and even with the boys, the kind of kind of uh, dark but comedic superhero, dramatic, you know, adaptation from, you know, the, the, um, the Wildstorm imprint comic book from D.C., and it's like, you can't be pigeonholed, but you seem to do well and do great work, you know, whether it's pure drama, pure comedy, action. And, and so I've always admired you for that. You know, it's like, even Jumping the Broom, I tell people, it's not really a black film any more than My Big Fat Greek Wedding was only for Greek people. It's just a great film that happens to have, be around, you know, multifaceted aspects of black families. So, so I just got to say at the top, man, it's, it's just amazing it, when you connect all the dots. And of course, I left a lot of things out that you've done. Um, the, the kind of career that you're, you're still building towards something and, you know, kind of it's a slow burn to what is now, I think, really a triumphant turn in your role um, with the boys and, and with um, that, that successful series for Amazon. 
you know, jumping off the top, talk to me about, you know, just your whole approach. I mean, you, you come out of Howard University, proud grad of, of Howard, a business degree, emphasis in marketing, um, and yet you, you go on to build this really great career. And then obviously, you're not even done. This is you on the ascension at this stage of your career, even as you've gotten a lot of work under your belt. Talk to me about, about, about your whole approach to that. You know, I'll tell you, man. Uh, first of all, thank you for having me. Thank you for uh, for acknowledging me. And uh, I received the flowers. It's good to get flowers, you know, while you're alive. <laughs> so uh, any any opportunity that that I can get recognized and acknowledged, uh, I appreciate you. Um, uh, you know, for me, my career has been something that has been a labor of love and passion. Um, I learned very early in my career not to take jobs simply for the money that you were going to get paid. Uh, I was very fortunate to have a degree in business. So coming into this business, I, I was very frugal. I was very disciplined. And I managed myself so that I wouldn't be put in a position where I have to do something that compromises my spirit and my integrity. And that has allowed me the opportunity to say no to a lot of roles, roles in which I have seen others who have taken them for whatever reason, you know, everybody has their own reasons, have have tarnished them. And they've had to work very, very hard to, to come back to where they were prior to that that role. Um, so uh, I, I, I do feel that there is outside of it being an art, an art, an art it's an artistic medium. There's also a tremendous amount of business that takes play because we are our only product. Um, who we are on film determines our value in the industry and in the marketplace. And what we allow ourselves to do, the projects that we allow ourselves to be attached to can either raise our profile or lower our profile. Sometimes the projects that raise our profile might not be paying you that much. But it's the association with a director, if it's an Oscar winning director, if it's a project that you know is going to be poignant and Oscar winning or possibly get nominated or or really make a political or, or a social statement, then it's something that you really have to truly consider because it's not every day that as people of color, we get the opportunity to really make product that speaks to people, that talks about our history and, and who we are and who we were, where we've come from. Uh, and so uh, it, it, it's something that, you know, you have to say, okay, well, I'll do these two things because I need to keep the lights on. But this one here, this is something that I'm going to do because I love it and because it speaks to my soul and it's going to speak to other people's souls. So, you know, uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's a juggling act. It's a juggling act. You know, you, you will have your jobs that are money jobs. You know, and and that comes with with the territory. When your value does go up, you're going to get a lot more opportunities to make money. And among those, uh, there could be some that may not necessarily be as uh, artistically forward thinking. But, you know, sometimes, you know, you you you, you got to take care of moms. <laughs> but uh, but I can say that I'm proud of everything that I've worked on. Um, I have loved every character that I've played and, uh, and I'm grateful, man. I'm grateful to still be doing something that I love and, and doing it the way that I love doing it, not compromising, not compromising my integrity. Yeah, man. And, and, and doing great, great work. I mean, not only from the, you know, you know, we look at acting, you know, from two spectrums. One is, is it quality acting, Shakespearean, thespian, and then is it, it is it entertaining? Yes. Uh, and if you can get that common combination across all your roles, then you're doing it. You know, you, you're, you're critically doing a great job. You're technically doing a great job. But you're also doing a great job in a way that it, when all is said and done, it's an entertainment venue. And, yeah, you want to do, do it in a way that's uh, professionally, technically credible. But you also want to make sure that the masses really appreciate the work. And that's something, again, across just a wide, very diverse range of, of roles and projects. To me, that's been a consistent golden thread in your work. And obviously, as you get 
you're, you're, you're more veteran. You, you're getting, you, you're get, you, to me, you gain mastery. Only you know if you feel in yourself that you gain mastery. But from the person just who been observing your career, um, you know, I, I just really appreciate it. But speaking of you getting into characters, now, you got to know I'm a comic book geek. Um, I got a cap. I'm not going to turn the camera, but I got a Captain America shield over here. I got um, Green Lantern workout gear. We need, we I got need, Captain America. We need to get you a Soldier Boy shield over there, man. Oh, hook me up, bro. Hook me up. I'm, I'm with it. I'm Let with it. Let me work so, on that. Let me work on that. Okay, <laughs> uh, but I was, I'm familiar with the Wild Storm as an imprint. I, I got a, I got about probably six thousand comic books upstairs in my collection, and they're in there. Um, and I'm familiar with the boys. And I certainly know about you know Marvin Milk and and and, and that character from from the comic book series. Yeah. Talk to me. You talk about the roles you accept, what you're able to do with it, what you're hoping to do with it. What was your thought when when the opportunity to to do the boys? You know, it's a it's a it's a hit Emmy nominated series now. You just wrapped the third season, I believe. But at the front end, it's a very different. I think approach to a superhero, a comic book adaptation. You know, we we have the obviously the the Avengers from the Marvel Cinematic Universe. You got the Justice League, and while they are, you know, I won't say adult, if you will, the boys is a lot more in your face, real. Um, you know, uh, an interpretation of what um, happens in a world where there are people who are with superpowers, um, who all of whom aren't. The heroes aren't really all the heroes, and the villains are more heroes than than the world that particular universe acknowledges. I, I, let me not, not put words in your mouth. Talk to me about the character, the role, the storyline, and what appealed to you about um, just doing it, being a part of that. So, what appealed to me uh, first and foremost was that it was a narrative on current uh, society. Uh, it shined a mirror on. Uh, pop culture and our celebrity worship that has kind of become uh, status quo through social media. Now everyone has fans, everyone has followers, everyone has likes, and they they post for the purpose of getting that that immediate gratification of of you know likes, um, follows. Uh, there is a social currency that kind of creates a, a pecking order or food chain where people fall on it based on how many followers you have on what platform. So uh, there, the, the world that we're living in now is not the world that existed 10 years ago. Um, even as early as back in MySpace, it was just a different vibe. And in many ways, it's for the better because people are more in control of their product, for example, in the music industry. You know, social media has now become a means for artists to directly communicate to their fans and reach them. But from another standpoint, it has also created a, a society of narcissists, of people who need that immediate, you know, dopamine rush of, of uh, validation for posting something that triggers a reaction in people that see it. When I when I got the script for the boys, instantly I got it. I got it instantaneously. And what I liked about it was that it portrayed the superheroes in a very human and realistic form. Because at the end of the day, outside of, let's say, Superman, who's not of this planet, maybe a couple of other soups, superheroes that aren't humans. Everybody else is a human. Everybody else is from this planet. They just happen to have, you know, a, 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 a power. And if you look at society... And, and even, Superman, even Superman was raised as a human. He was so raised he, as a human, right. He's acculturated as a human, despite his heritage being unhuman. Right. He's an alien, though, you know? Yes. So, yeah. uh, so, you know, what our show attempts to do is to shine a mirror on society and show the haves and the have-nots. And how these haves, although to the public, they may appear like these great, beautiful, sexy, strong, morally upright and upstanding people, behind closed doors, they really suffer from the same insecurities as everybody else does. 
suffer from the same type of, you know, their spouse or their significant other might be cheating on them or they might be very insecure or within their circle of superheroes, they are not super. You know, they're very mediocre or lower class, lower tier, because that's another thing too is, you know, in our superheroes, you have the, the privileged, which are the seven, and then you have all the rest of the superheroes that are not the privileged folks. You know, wow. so and and cor and how corporate politics and corporate greed and corporate uh, uh, capitalistic, you know, uh, movements. And listen, I'm not shooting. I'm I'm not shooting down corporations, but I am saying that greed has to be checked. And in our world, greed yes. goes unchecked. You know, and so it, it really shines a light on human vulnerabilities. On what what would you do if you had unlimited power would you continue to be the good person that you are now or would you would you cheat a little bit you know would you run that red light because you know you can't get a ticket you know would you steal that ferrari because you know who's going to stop you you know and so it challenges a lot of what what normally is in society we've accepted as norms it it kind of shines a light on how vulnerable is society if if the haves stop uh, respecting those norms. And in a lot of ways, we see it in society now, and it's being exposed every day on the news, when very powerful people choose to uh, uh, abuse their power and ignore their responsibility to society to follow the law. Tell me about who Marvin Mother's Milk is and, and where he fits into this scenario. So Mother's Milk is a brother from Harlem. I always like to start with that because that is his, that's what he leads with, his DNA. Um, he is an avid hip hop fan. I felt that it was important for him to make a statement uh, before he opens his mouth. You know, so in his wardrobe, he always dons a, a hip hop uh, t-shirt. Um, he represents the culture. I wanted the culture to be represented through this character, through his gear, through his speech, through his the way he conducts himself. You know, those brothers on 125th Street that sell incense, they'll check you real quick if you disrespect the system, you know, and that's mother's milk. That's where he comes from. You know, that's his DNA. Um, it, it, he, he's, a, he's, he's, a, he's a black man that does not ignore what society has done to black people throughout history and how how integral black people have played in the history of saving this country and he does so every day by being part of the boys that is part of his his uh mission is to not leave behind a world that's that he had to deal with growing up. He wants to leave a better world for his daughter and for the next generation. You know, um, he is a father. He is a proud girl dad. Uh, that's something that uh, I, I've also been very, very passionate about always pushing is that he is a present and good father, regardless of what he has to do, you know, on his day job when he's out there hunting down superheroes, bad superheroes, you know, he's going to do whatever it takes to be a present father and to be there for his daughter. Um, because if our show breaks stereotypes, then my character should be breaking a stereotype too. And so I decided that my character, one of the stereotypes that he was going to break is the uh, black men are absentee fathers. That was something that I wanted to shatter. And so he has made his daughter his priority in his life. Um, and, you know, he is also a superhero in his own right. You know, I, I always say uh, his super suit is his leather jacket and his hip hop heat tees. You know, that that's his super suit. You know, he don't need a cape, that's his cape. You know, and, and, I, and his gold chain and his Jordans. You know, he is a brother. And I wanted people to feel brother when he is on, anytime he's on camera, I don't want it to go unnoticed that he is a strong black man from New York and he's going to represent himself and the culture first. You know, it's, it's an Emmy nominated series. Again, it is the top series on Amazon. You, you, um, you just finished your third season. 
you're at that point in a hit show when you've learned a lot in your character, you've evolved with your character. If you had to say, what, what's the difference between how you how, what, how you saw and feel and portrayed Marvin Mother's Milk in season one and where the series is taking him today? So season one, I, uh, I was trying to find Mother's Milk. So first couple of episodes, he's not the same Mar Marvin Mother's Milk that he is today. Uh, but... Uh, to, to his defense, or to the character's defense, he was working at a juvenile facility, you know, for underprivileged kids who, you know, for one reason or another got in trouble with the law, and it was his job to get them back on track. You know, so I, I give the character that kind of uh, grace, because him coming right back into the boys, you're not going to get immediately, he's just going to jump in and he's back on track. He's still trying to figure this thing out because, you know, for the last few years, he's been at a boys' detention center. That's been what he's been doing happily, happily doing, still giving back, but his own way. Now that he's on with the boys, it took him a minute. Uh, and when, when he finally dials in and clicks in, that's when you see the leather jacket. That's when you see the T-shirt. That's when you see the, the shoes. And so that becomes like, the transition from, okay, he's still Marvin, even though he's with the boys, he's still Marvin, but now he's mother's milk, you know? And then in season two, uh, it took a minute for him to get back in as well. And season three as well, you know, season three, he's, he's with his daughter, he's wearing a sweater, <laughs> butcher comes and, you know, he's at his, her birthday party wearing a sweater, he's home, he's wearing regular clothes, uh, his hair, he's wearing a little fro, you know, his beard is kind of wigged out, kind of like I, how I was looking during COVID. Uh, but when Butcher comes and recruits him back into the boys and he decides, OK, I'm going back into the boys. You know, the, the hair goes away, the beard gets trimmed and he puts his, his outfit back on. So there's a very distinct transition that takes place when he goes from being Marvin to being Mother's Milk. You know, um, I could talk about with you with you about the boys forever, so I'm not going to burn up the whole show because I, you know, I, I you know, I, I've interviewed um, um, Jesse T. Usher before at the American Black Film Festival a couple of years ago. This is before the boys, and so, and so I am somewhat also fantas um, fascinated with his character, another another brother um, who's a member of the Seven, who has amazing <laughs> deep Trump issues um, uh, around some of the things you've already raised, and we won't go we into do. it. As eight yeah, grade. we all, we're yeah, all yeah, very absolutely. troubled in absolutely. our own absolutely. way. In, in your own yeah. way. Um, but Adrian's yeah. character is fascinating, you know, for a whole another set of different reasons. But let, let me shift off the boys before I, like, burn up the whole conversation being uh, because, of, because of my admiration for the work in the show. Let, let's talk about the, your broader experience. Again, you're, you're not, you're true to the game, but you're not new to the game. Um, you, you, I really want to get your thoughts now, especially as we, as we come post- Oscar so white post, um, you know, uh, George Floyd in the era of commitment to diversity, equity and inclusion. A lot of progress has been made. Um, we can still make the case that, that we have a long way to go. But talk to me about what you see happening, what has happened. You look at people like Issa Rae and Jordan Peele and Charles King, uh, founder of Macro. Where do you see us now in terms of representation, representation, change and diversity in Hollywood, film, entertainment, whatever you want to call it. What are, your, what are you seeing and what do you expect to see? You know, I, I, I do, I have been around long enough now at this stage of my uh, career to see cycles, kind of cycles come and go in our business. When I first got in this business, there was a cycle where African-Americans were doing very well at that time through the sitcom, through the sitcom genre. You know, you had the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, you had Jamie Foxx show, you had Martin, you had Cedric the Entertainer, you had Bernie Mac, you had uh, D.L. Hughley show, you had Monique show, you had uh, Countess Vaughn, you had uh, Raven Simone, you had all these people at the time that were in the Flex Alexander as well. The, the, the yeah. half hour platform, uh, and they were killing it. They were killing it. Um, these were all black showrunners that were running these shows. 
black writer staffs. Um, so artistically at the time, we weren't just represented on camera, but we were also represented behind the camera as well. Um, that era kind of went away at a certain point and it became more single camera uh, comedy shows and one hour dramas. And eventually uh, the cycle came back again now and we're starting to see African-Americans again uh, in the driver's seat when it comes to showrunners, when it comes to creators, when it comes to writers, when it comes to storytelling. Um, we're seeing also, I think, a lot more in the, in the, in the area of uh, directors, particularly black women directors. Um, you know, black women directors are literally like really pushing the envelope forward. At one time, Debbie Allen was one of just a handful you know, now we have so many, you know, um, that that are working and doing amazing work, not just on black shows, but also on white shows as well and, and any other show. Um, so uh, my hopes are that it's not cyclical, that this trend will continue to be permanent and moving forward. Um, of course, we have to continue to put out product that our people watch and support. You know, so it has to be product that is honest, that is uh, that is not uh, uh, a gimmicky. It has to be something that people really respond to and feel like they're 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 being uh, understood and spoken to. Um, and I and I truly believe that what I've seen, you know, from so many amazing shows that have come out both in streaming and uh, on cable. Um, that we're really like knocking it out the park from 50 cents, the power universe and uh, Courtney uh, and, and all that stuff that they've been working on to, um, like you said, Issa Rae and Jordan Peele and everybody. I mean, you know, there is an honesty in, in everyone's material that is uh, universally uh, appealing. And it also genuinely speaks to the culture, it, you know, uh, Donald Glover also with ATL. I mean, there's so much good stuff out there. Um, uh, I, I can go on forever. I think that where we still need to, we have room to grow and, and have work to do is in the C-suites. Um, development executives are really who green light projects. They are the ones who say yay or nay on whether or not a studio will take on a, a, a project. And a lot of times you can have an amazing show that would do gangbuster numbers with the audiences, but the person that is green lighting shows and sitting uh, on the other side of the pitching table uh, has to get it. And if they don't get it, then that show may not see the light of day, no matter how good it is. You know, so uh, what I have seen that is not a good trend is at one time, I remember there was like one black person in at every studio, and they were the guy that everybody would go through to pitch their projects and get their movies made. Devon Franklin at one time was one of them. Uh, 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 James Lopez at one time was one of them. You know, there's always been one, and that's the guy. And when they move on to do other things, you know, James now is over at Macro. Uh, Devon Franklin has his own company. Uh, that void usually doesn't get filled. And so you'll see that that studio fails to make uh, stuff for us until that void gets filled again. Zola Mashariki at one time when she was at Fox Searchlight. You know, I, I, I knew all the people because everybody knows them because they're the only people right. <laughs> at that studio in town. And, you know, when there's, when, when there's one, everybody knows them. That's, that's the person that you got to go in and see. Uh, Dude, I'm not even in the business I've interviewed you Zola. I've interviewed like these people. Like if they're if they're somebody, yep. somebody I've interviewed them or somebody at Black and Brown interviewed them because you're like you're right. They're few and far you. between, and there's no pipeline. Exactly. You know when they move on, there's no pipeline. Behind. I will say this, and I take a tremendous amount of pride in this program that uh, uh, Dr. Frederick at Howard University and myself uh, spearheaded. We uh, he came to California one time and he asked to meet me for dinner. And uh, I was I was like, OK, it's my turn now. 
to uh, start giving back to the to, to Howard. <laughs> you yeah. know, once you once you on a couple of shows and they see, oh, okay, our alumni are doing well. Come come, come and pay back. Start start giving back in dues. It's like all right. I, I was already ready with the checkbook. I was like, okay, it's my turn now. And I went to have dinner with him, and uh, he he wanted to pick my brain uh, and find out. How can we develop Howard into a pipeline for Hollywood for uh, filmmaking, directors, producers, uh, actors, um, crew, construction, electricians, all those departments? And I told him, I said, Doc, I'm going to be honest with you. Uh, anybody that has a, doctor's, a doctor in front of the name, I call him Doc. Uh, but I told him, you know, I said, in those areas, we can always do better. But where we really, really, truly need help and what will really set the pick for us to do better is if we really focus on the C-suites. We need people running studios. We need people in executive positions, in positions that they can green light projects in positions that you can go in and pitch. And then I gave him the whole spiel about there's only one at each studio. And when they go away, there's a, I told him the whole thing and he got it. But Dr. Frederick is, is the kind of guy that doesn't just get something and it stays there. Dr. Frederick is a doer, big fan of this guy. All, I didn't realize what I was doing, but what I essentially did was I signed up to work for Dr. Frederick for the next eight months. <laughs> and now we're on the phone two, three times a week. We're taking meetings. He's coming to California. Let's coordinate schedules so you can go to these meetings with me. I'm at Paramount. I'm at Amazon. I'm at Netflix. I'm at Disney. I'm at every studio in town. I'm meeting with Jimmy Iovine. Um, and I'm at every studio in town with him meeting to put together Howard Entertainment as a program. Wow. And so what we did was uh, we created a program in conjunction with UCLA that takes students from the school of uh, uh, not just school of uh, arts, but also from liberal arts department, because English majors are writers. Right. What runs this town? Writers, screenwriting. So we got students from pretty much every major from architecture because every set needs to be created, constructed. We need architects um, to school of business because our it's the entertainment business. You still need marketers. You still need accountants. You still need lawyers. You still need um, uh, 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 every, Analyst. every area. Analyst. Yeah, finance. Analyst. Yeah, finance. Yeah. Um, and so, and, and school of law. Because this city, everybody has an attorney in this city, you know, everybody. So yeah. entertainment law is also very, very important. And so we took both graduate and undergraduate students and created this entertainment program in conjunction with Amazon Studios and, uh, and UCLA. And now Howard University students have a pipeline where they spend a semester here in L.A., um, they can intern at different studios around town and learn how each studio works. Production companies as well, everywhere from Jordan Peele's company to Will Packer's company. Um, and uh, when they graduate, the hopes are that they have developed enough work experience and they have a resume that says, I can hit the ground running and get a job at any of these studios or any of these networks or any of these production companies or streamers and add value. And then at that point, it's up to them to work their way up within the C-suites. So it, it's that that's something that I am significantly proud of that I can say I was on the ground floor of uh, helping to create with Dr. Frederick. And now I, from last I heard when I talked to Dr. Frederick, he's trying to figure out how to extend it to all HBCUs. So it's not just Howard wow. students, but other HBCUs can also participate. Man, that is incredible because what you're talking about is uh, attacking, I won't even say attacking the problem, attacking the opportunity at the yep. root instead of at the fruit or lack yep. thereof. So you're talking about planting the seeds for 
the next couple of generations who obviously will plant more seeds for the next couple of generations. And that's, that's, that's the thing I'm kind of most optimistic about in terms of this cycle, not just in the entertainment industry, but this cycle of where we've come out of as a country, as we wrestle with issues of equity and inclusion and, 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 and racism and fairness is that yes, the pendulum is going to swing back and forth. Like you said, the cycle is not going to stop being a cycle. But I feel, and this is after talking to you, I've, you know, I've talked to Tari Turner, I've talked to Wayne Brady um, on, on the show, and in, we've had conversations outside the show um, because they're just people I talk to on a regular basis, that yes, we know everything's cyclical. So no matter how quote unquote good things are now, there will be an ebb. But the ebb, it feels like the ebb really can't go back to what it was. It may ebb. But you're, you and others uh, are, and, and are laying the kind of foundation in this window of opportunity that says there may be some diminution going forward, but it can't devolve to what it was before. And, you know, and, you know our progress, maybe human progress, not just black progress, has always been like four or five steps forward, three steps back, six steps forward, two steps, you know. And we always lament, obviously, when we get pushed backwards and we think, you know, but I tell people, if you look at the long run, it's like the stock market. Over time, we're ahead, <laughs> even if we've suffered short-term setbacks that can be very discouraging. And also remind, so, I mean, thank you. Yeah, for no, I, also remind, I also like to remind people, too, when they complain about, well, why don't we have this or why don't he, we have that? I, I love to remind people that African-Americans in 1967 still could not vote. Right, right. And... We, 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 we've come an incredibly long way in, 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 in a generation. Years, less than in 50 years, yes. not only yes. have we gotten the power to vote, but we are some of the most powerful voices in Congress. We are some of the most artistic uh, and com commodi commodity driven forces in entertainment, from music to sports to uh, 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 film and TV. Black people have a lot to be proud of and a lot to pat themselves on the back. Finance, you know, you're looking at now the podcast game exploding with back black financial literacy, uh, young people, young voices who are teaching yeah. the next generation on how to invest, how important it is to invest. When I was coming up, you wanted to save your money to go buy Jordans. These brothers are now saving up to buy NFTs, you know, and crypto, mm -hmm. you know. So I, 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 I sometimes and listen, I love that we as a people of color are always forward thinking and pushing and never lazy or, or feeling like we have arrived because we haven't. But I do think that black people have a lot to celebrate because... And I, and I think that's important for, I mean, I'm older than you are, um, you know, but for, for those of us who do have a little bit of perspective because we've been out here for yeah. a while, you know, I, I was you know talking to um, one of the young brothers at, at Black Enterprise, who's probably in his late 20s, early 30s. Um, we were talking about sports. And I was like, I'm old enough to remember, the, the, you know, Marlon Briscoe, the, the, the first black quarterback ever starting in the NFL. I remember when that was like a thing. When we were ever going to get a black quarterback? And I said, you think, I said, I, you know, I'm, I'm uh, one generation. I said, y'all, now nobody blinks. Back then, back, when back a black then it was okay for them to say that you can't have black quarterbacks because they're not smart enough. You remember that? They yes. Used, they, literally, yes. that's what they would talk yes. about on sports shows. And on it, the was, it was okay. It wasn't nobody even like... was getting fired for saying that. You know, and right. now we're at the point where we see both from the Kansas, from Kansas City to Baltimore, we see black quarterbacks not only being athletic, but being uh, 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 situationally I IQ wise ahead of everybody else. Yes. You know, so yes. um, we, we have come a tremendously long way and we're, we're still going. I mean, when I was coming up, man, when I was at Howard, you know, I I looked up to Earl Graves. You know, Earl Graves was the sign of success. You know what I'm saying? I was like, when you can rock, when you can rock sideburns that big, you know, <laughs> you've made it. You know what I'm saying? But there was only yeah. one Earl Graves. 
here and there, you know, the publisher of Ebony or the publisher of Essence, you know, uh, uh, maybe the brother uh, on Wall Street, I uh, can't remember his name right now. Uh, why should white guys have all the fun? Uh, Oh, yeah, Reggie, Reggie Lewis. Lewis. Reggie Lewis. 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 You know, but, yeah. but there were yeah. there were black names that uh, you could count them on one hand that were right. either billionaires or or playing in that area. You know, uh, Bob Johnson from BET. Yes. Um, now yes. look at what we're seeing. We're seeing a whole new regime of young black billionaires from entertainment. That's not even including from finance and everything else. You know, so right, right. Uh, this is a this is a, a, a very, very promising time. I think it's a little threatening for some to see this as well, because if we see it, other people see it as well. But uh, mm-hmm. it, it also is it presents a tremendous amount of opportunity for us to now be able to network across. You know, we've always had to network up, you know, the, 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 the word network. And when I was coming up was who can reach down and help pull you up, you know. And, right, and right. those were the posters that we'd see, you know, uh, on, on campus. You know, you'd have one black hand doing this and another black hand doing this, you know. Right, now right. we are in a new generation where we can reach to the sides and network laterally and work with each other because yes. we all have a platform and we all bring something to the table. And it's, to me, I think it's, it's beautiful. So listen, Laz, in the time that we have left, I just thank you for just being so generous with your time for this conversation. Um, I always like to, to get the guest view of what they see going forward on two fronts. For yourself, in terms of you know, wh- where you're taking things from here. Uh, now, a lot of times we're like, we're not going to plan, but it's so far ahead because things change so fast around us. But And then for your, for your profession, for your industry, I know we just talked about where we are now both the progress and the challenges, but, but what, what, where's your head right now in terms of what things look like, you know, let's say for the next two to five years. And, and what is it that you, you, you're kind of already laid out with just what you're doing with Howard, a, a pretty strong agenda for what you're doing, but what is your take on, on where we're headed and, and what we should be focused on, what our audience here for beyond the hype. Uh, I, 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 every single young actor that comes to me for advice the first thing I tell them is, uh, have you taken a writing class? And if they say no, I tell them, enroll in a writing class. If you're in school still, no matter what your major is, choose it as an elective. If you're not in school, sign up for a writing class. Go Google it. There are tons. Everybody lives in a place where there are local universities or community colleges that offer uh programs, night school and programs for just credit, um, where you don't have to be a, get in a four year program or a two year program. You could just take a class, just pay your money and take one class, but enroll in a writing class because, uh, when you create, you own IP intellectual property and intellectual property is gold in the entertainment industry. Whoever owns the intellectual property owns the building. You know, and you can sell intellectual property the same way you would real estate, the same way you buy a house and flip it. People understand that. Or you buy a stock, hold it. And when the value goes up, you sell it, you flip it and you get that profit and you can buy more stock. It's the same way with screenplays um, and intellectual property. You know, you, you don't necessarily have to write it. You can option someone else's screenplay or book or article. But the point is, is. Uh, you become a creator. You can be a creator and be more in control of your destiny. You still got to work hard. You still got to, you know, study acting. You still got to commit to being an actor if that's what you want to be or director or producer or whatever. But in addition to that, nowadays you have to be multi-talented. You have to uh, multitask and wear and have a different slashes behind your name. Um, My slash uh, moving forward is producer. I've been talking about it for a while, but I have finally reached the place in my career where uh, I can make phone calls and those phone calls get answered. And so uh, I'm, I'm very, very excited about now being able to take things that have been blessed to me 
uh, it, when ideas and opportunities to, uh, to do both unscripted projects, scripted projects on film and television, and be able to get them to the next level uh, as a producer. And that to me is, I, I feel like, a, I feel like I'm, I'm young again. Like when I first got started in, in acting, that fresh, brand new feeling of being the underdog and, and working hard and working day and night. And, you know, you, you're on a computer just going nonstop. Like, that's how it feels because it's so exciting, man, to like take on something new and be able to see, be able to truly see it uh, coming to life. You know, and so I, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm a big believer in, in vision. You got to see it first. If you don't see it, then, then ain't nobody else going to see it. But uh, it's different when the vision has, you know, structure. And, uh, and, and, and that's just a very, very exciting place to be at. And, you know, that, that will also allow me to put more people that look like me on camera, you know, which has always been my goal, is, is how can I get more people that look like me and sound like me, you know, on camera and behind the scenes and, and give them an opportunity to shine too. So it feels good, man. It's a it's a it's it's a very good uh, place to be, and um, not to mention, of course, season four of the boys. I'll be going back into production shortly, and uh, you know, get to take mother's milk mother's milk on another ride again. Man, my opinion usually of, of hit series is that see when you get to season three and four, uh, you know, not that the subsequent seasons aren't you know, impactful, and not that the early seasons don't mean anything because you got to start somewhere, but you're get, you're getting into some great opportunities, some great work when you took season man. three and four. I'm one of those people since I don't watch a lot, a high volume of work. I kind of commit to one or two things and just ride it out. But then I, every once in a while, I'll I'll get to a series, usually in season three and four, and be like, oh man, I got to go back and watch <laughs> what I missed because that those three or those three season four seasons will get you. Um, so I'm, I'm definitely looking forward to season four of the boys and, uh, you know, listen, man, and, and, you know, is there anything else you want to share before, no, before man, we uh, Any, anything else? I mean, you've been so generous with your time and your wisdom and, and, and your, and your views and, you know, but is there anything else you want to leave with the uh, audience? To be honest with you, I feel like we've covered a, a tremendous amount. Um, listen, man, I'm just, uh, excited to share more. Uh, I hope that. I can give back more. That's my goal too, is to be able to inspire more people and to utilize my platform to help people, you know, uh, in, in, in however God has blessed me in that opportunity to do, you know? Amen. Um, so so Amen. that is definitely on, on my, on my to-do list as well, is not just expand my vessel, but also be able to help those that want to expand as well. Yeah, you said it. You said the word, man. I tell people all the time: we're we're, we're vessels. We're not. It's not just for us. It's to come through 100%. us for others, uh, and we're blessed in that as well. So, listen, Laz, I love you. You you blessed me. God blessed me to have you as a brother friend. Um, you know, you know, you're. I'm thinking about you. I tell people, no matter how long we haven't seen each other, and how much time goes by. Uh, when you love somebody, it doesn't matter. Time it just is, don't matter, and I, that's how I, I feel about you. Right where we left off else, every brother, time, brother. You know what I'm saying? That's a real friendship. Oh yeah, right. oh yeah. And no doubt, no doubt, no doubt. So listen, thank you so much for joining us for Beyond the Hype. Looking forward, obviously, as as a fan and a friend, to seeing which, where you take things going forward. And I, and I just appreciate it. Thank you. Thank man. you for Have joining a great us. One. Well, another great edition, you know how we do, of Beyond the Hype. We're here with Las Alonso. Another great conversation, another great show. Um, this episode has been brought to you by City. Thank you, City. And listen, be back. Got some more great conversations coming up. Thanks for joining us. Take care. Be blessed. Celebrate the excellence in black men at the Black Enterprise Black Men Excel Summit. Meet our country's best and brightest black men who are redefining their image. We need to make sure that the world knows that we are here and that we are doing our business, so let us salute ourselves for that.
be there this October 12th through the 14th at the Gaylord National Resort and Convention Center in National Harbor, Maryland. It's time for people to see that black men are doing great things and doing it positively. By doing this Excel Summit, it empowers us, it inspires us to be more creative and to do things that we haven't necessarily or traditionally done. I met some great people here that I plan to do business with in the future, and I plan to um, learn from. This was an eye-opening experience. For more information, log on to blackenterprise.com slash BMX. <laughs>